can sort of see how it just recycles you back into the system and maintains that sort of vulnerability status. And significantly, it also creates the real, a new decisive barrier. Citizenship is no longer the barrier of inclusion and exclusion. It's really permanent residence that this decisive wall exists, probably not an appropriate metaphor for Germany, between those who are included and those who are sort of perpetually excluded. In the UK, we see an entirely different context. It wasn't about uh, in, uh, citizenship being solved and therefore addressing the real problem, which is integration. In the UK, adoption of policy was linked entirely to schools reform. There was no citizenship curriculum at school, so they adopted this new curriculum, um, the citizenship classes for the national curriculum in 1997. That was very successful, so Tony Blair said, we should do the same for immigrants. So he employed the exact same people. You see a significant role of ideation entrepreneurship here. Same people move from the education office to the home office, exact same people. Um, from David Blunkett as home secretary to uh, Bernard Crick, who viewers out there might know, um, to adapt the exact same idea that we should educate citizens on what it means to be a citizen to immigrants. We should educate immigrants on what it means to be a citizen. The idea was to promote, not hinder citizenship. The idea, the, the, the problem was, too many people are staying permanent residents. How do we get them to become citizens? We need to give them something to join, something that they would want to join. So let's promote citizenship. Uh, they created these two routes. You can either take a test, or if you don't feel like your English is good enough, you can take some classes and in a context of citizenship, and that should be sufficient. Right? So you had a choice to do one of the two routes, at the end of which uh, you would become um, a British citizen. In 2005, that was extended to an earlier barrier, so move from citizenship to residence, um, uh, with the idea that promote, getting people earlier, getting them excited about British citizenship or about Britishness earlier, might get them more excited about citizenship. That proved not to be very successful either. Um, and then later, we see some real significant restrictive turns when we had a different, uh, when we had different, um, when the coalition government came in. So really different objectives at work, uh, though as we will see, still really within this liberal framework, this uh, this concept of promoting belonging. Um, so on balance, what has resulted from the British approach is that it has yielded some inadvertent restriction, not by design but practice. So in contrast to the very managerial, state-directed German system, the, the, Brit, uh, the British model maintains an incredibly laissez-faire approach, where you as the immigrant, you self-assess entirely. Do you think you're ready to take the test? Take the test, right? You make that choice for yourself. Um, if, you know, or you, take the, you, know, you choose to take the course. The state isn't judging whether you're fit to take the test. It's allowing you, the individual. The state is really stepping out of that decision. So the fail rates are primarily a result of people just taking the test over and over. That's driving down the pass rate because you know the test is 34 pounds to take. The course is you know three evenings of your week for a year, right? So I mean, sort of a no-brainer. You might keep trying to do the test if you can. Um, there's no ties to benefits, right? There's a statutory prohibition on ben on receiving benefits until you get permanent residence. So there's no kind of dependency loop or conditionality of of uh, benefit utilization to obtain permanent residence. The cost, like I said, is very low. Um, and, and like I said, the fail rate is what drives up, or sort of the self-assessment is what drives up the fail rate, not the design of the test. So as we see here, the majority of people took the test. This is the number of people that completed the knowledge of life requirement in 2008, 9, and 10. The majority of people took the, the, the test route. So the government looked at this and said, well, we're just going to end the course route then, right? Nobody's doing it. Um, people are not self-assessing appropriately. We're just going to end it. And so ending it, 2011, 2012, has not changed the pass rates, inter interestingly enough. Uh, on average, for, so for settlement and citizenship, it's about 68%. But recently, looking just at settlement alone, it has risen significantly. So. Um, and, and in the end, only 2% of people actually get denied citizenship because of the knowledge of life requirement. So uh, any sort of restrictive element of it is not by design, but by, well, I guess, is inadvertent through the design, 
the laissez-faire design, right? But not deliberately to be um, exclusive. Okay, so that the, those two cases there show kind of how the context, how parties, um, I didn't really get a chance to talk a lot about labor party preferences um, or, or the coalition preferences, but how different contexts drive really different policy outcomes, both in terms of um, effects and performance. Uh, in, the, in this comparison, how am I doing on time? I'm uh, jogging through this. Yeah, like 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay, yeah. great. Uh, this pair comparison offers just a really, it's, it's just a cool story. It's a really interesting story, because you know, far-right parties are really fun, um, unless you're <laughs> the object of their interest, and then they're not very fun. Um, <laughs> So this offers a really interesting comparison because there's a lot of similarities between the Dutch and the French case. Now, I include integration policy regimes here uh, because that's sort of one of the really prevalent explanations behind new civic integration policy is this idea that existing integration policies failed. So this makes a really good comparison because they both have kind of, uh, coherent understandings of integration uh, that pre-exist civic integration. Uh, so I included. Um, I'm not going to talk much about it today, but it's, it's discussed in much detail in the book how sort of this coherence and understanding of inclusion uh, or of integration uh, informed uh, party preferences. They both had inclusive citizenship start points uh, with sort of coherent understandings of belonging, whatever those definitions may be. They had sim similar political processes where the left introduces the policy and the right co-ops it makes it more restrictive uh, where the far-right plays a role because they both have really significant far-right parties uh, intervene into the, the or step, step into the sort of political theater at this time. Uh, and yet you see really, really stark differences in their membership policies. Uh, and the explanation I provide is as a result of the mechanisms, um, how the far-right influences these processes of, uh, oh, of the context of far party politics. So. Uh, what I do in, in, in this comparison is I develop an explanation using the Dutch case, and then I'm, um, so I sort of conduct theory development process tracing with the Dutch case, and then test it in the, in the French case, which is how I kind of came to this really interesting finding about the differences in causal mechanisms. So to briefly go into the story, and it's gonna be super brief, um, policy adoption took place in the context of consensus. The, Grand Co uh, the, the Purple Coalition under Wim Koop, um, where the left, um, the left Labor Party and the right Vivi Day, they both agreed, they were both in coalition together um, that they needed to promote what was called the autonomy of individuals. And in order to achieve the autonomy of individuals, they introduced the world's first civic integration policy. They mentioned the term civic integration, right? Um, which shifted sort of the thinking from group-oriented to individual-oriented integration. So this is how it sort of, uh, came on the coattails of, of the multicultural 90s, that we moved from group-oriented uh, integration to individual-oriented autonomy. Uh, so they introduced in 1998 sort of the language, the orientation courses. Uh, in 2002, the uh, Lisp Pim Fortine, after their successful, um, well, after his assassination, but then their successful gains in the, in the parliament um, of seats and their uh, joining of government for 87 days, but nonetheless, they really accelerated what were existing predispositions towards restriction. Existing predispositions on both sides of the aisle. So both the left and the right agreed in um, the same trajectory. It's not that the left, or it's not that the far right um, introduced it, but they accelerated it. And so the, the far right played a significant role here in accelerating um, the, uh, uh, sorry, in, played a role in accelerating what ended up being restrictive layering in a context of consensus. So where the left and right agree that they want to pursue restriction together, the far right played a role in accelerating that restriction and allowing for restriction upon restriction, but in the context of consensus. That's really key, where both left and right agreed on the direction of integration policy, and then where the far right accelerated that. Uh, and so you had successive, uh, what I call restrictive layering, which made the policies more and more difficult, kept raising the language barrier, kept raising the, the expectations of um, uh, the number of hours, right? Uh, made the tests more and more difficult. That's what I mean by restrictive layering. So it's the integration policies became more and more difficult 
In 2007, they, they changed the integration policy entirely, um, where the focus moved from this idea of autonomy and inclusion to really integration as a device of control. That uh, the idea became, instead of just promoting course participation, immigrants had to sit an integration exam, a five-part exam. I mean, if you want to talk about difficult exams, uh, I'll, I can go through some of the components if you like. There were practical components where you had to sit and discuss how you would find a doctor. You had to show a portfolio that showed that you met with your doctor and you had a conversation in Dutch. I mean, this is like, it, it, it was like practical components, a language test, a knowledge test, a look at this picture of a windmill, you know, wh how do you say that in Dutch? It, I mean, unbelievably, um, an unbelievable, unbelievable change from what had pre-existed in terms of just promoting course participation. Uh, the fee shifted where the use of municipalities to pay for the courses, the individual then became responsible. Uh, it was extended to what were called um, sort of the people who had settled before the law came into pass, so it became retroactive. Uh, the, then the new attachment of all these legal economic sanctions, I mean, the takeaway here is this really changed and what resulted in the end was possible because of this incremental restrictive layering over time in the context of consensus. In the end, so you look at these numbers and you think, wow, like, those are pretty good. Those are much better than the UK, right? But it's really, it's a targeted exclusion. So who is being deliberately excluded here are family-based migrants and the unskilled. Um, so they, they experience, if I, if I put up here numbers of you know, Moroccan or Turkish uh, immigrants, Turks no longer are required to meet these because of a, a national a court decision. Uh, but, I mean, those pass rates are 40s, 50s percent. I mean, they're really low. So you're getting targeted um, uh, exclusion. Overall inclusive, right, to, you know, majority of immigrants are doing quite well, but it's the targeted exclusions that make this a really restrictive instrument. Um, so what we see then, what, what, what I observe then, so when you have a left party in power, the distributional effects sort of suggests this continuity of policy, right? This inclusive, individual-oriented policy to promote autonomy. When the right party moves to power, you have um, maintaining the context of consensus, but through the process of layering, you have restrictive change. So this is predicted in the literature. Uh, it's just sort of identifying what the mechanisms are. In taking that model to France, right, we see sort of the same context in France, right? The left introduces a policy, um, Right, let's uh, so speak through this. Left introduces the policy, the right comes to power, and the far right plays a really significant role in setting the discourse uh, for that election. Um, and you see the policy become much more restrictive under the conservative government. The key difference in France, though, is that the far right amplifies the polarization, not a consensus. So whereas in the Netherlands you saw this consensus between the left and the right, so the far right uh, accelerating that uh, turn right, only allows for you know a quicker layering because you have such deep polarization. You know, if the 2002 election where um, you know Le Pen did so well in the first round or made it to the second round, right, um, one reading of that is that the National Front was popular, but the real reading of that is how decimated the left was, uh, and it just showed how weak and, and weak the left was and how polarized the political field was, and so the far right really just amplified this polarization. There was no stickiness. As, as I referred um, in, in the Dutch case. And so then when the socialists come back to power, they just removed all those policies. You didn't have that layering. You didn't have that aggregate effect over time. Uh, and there's also this really sort of obvious fear that if you discuss the idea of uh, anything other than assimilation in the French case, it's a tacit, assimil a tacit admission of failure. I know that all the time. There's no problem with assimilation. Uh, saying so would be, you know, admitting that you know, there's something wrong with assimilation. Okay, they did have a big debate, however, in 2009 about what it means to be French, so I think that kind of undercuts the message. Um, and so, looking at the same model, we see that the right party in power doesn't necessarily produce restrictive change. It produces strong restriction where you have layering, but weak restriction where you can just replace. Uh, so it's this neat kind of role that mechanisms play in really producing different outcomes. Uh, which is really the importance and one of the comparative advantages of qualitative pair comparison study. Uh, so in conclusion, what I saw is that you have these similar instruments, but they're designed really differently for different purposes and they have really different effects. 
which result from this dynamic interaction of different, pa different citizenship contexts and party politics. Um, therefore, civic integration, uh, certainly we see this civic turn, uh, but policies preserve different approaches to membership and achieve different goals in terms of incorporating outsiders and articulating standards of belonging. Uh, I make the case, therefore, that um, these new investments sort of renew and anchor existing positions on membership, existing understandings of belonging, and that may very well be then the last lease, um, the last lease on life of the nation state. Four cases. There you go. The end. Thanks.